Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. This is now our 33rd episode. Part two of Wajit Nefet, Enlightenment. Ah, <laughs> so let's just get started. Um, I, I just love this uh, quote by Rumi. Um, they actually said some of it, uh, used some of this in um, Interstellar, uh, which I'm going to talk about in an upcoming episode. But the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. We always forget we have to ask if the universe, you know, is going to deliver. Um, you must ask for what you want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Um, and this is a play on what we were talking about in the last episode about, you know, we are in this night cycle and we're being so encouraged to wake up and we are waking up. And my message here is don't go back to sleep. It's so much easier to be sucked back into 4D. But as we're waking up, we're starting to see things. We're not sure we like what we're seeing. We're starting to feel the energies. We're starting to know. We're, you know, we're, we're looking be behind the veil. The veil is thinning. The magnetic field around the earth and therefore around us as above, so below, it's thinning. And we're beginning to see through it. And we oftentimes we're just in shock at what we're seeing. You know, sometimes we like, and sometimes we, all too often we don't like what we're seeing. Um, but this is our moment. Don't go back to sleep. Well, it's really a red pill, blue pill situation. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, and it is a choice. Um, but again, <laughs> Again, I love Rumi, and, and some of what he says is so concise, but it with, holds within it depths of knowledge and knowing. Um, and in something just so short and sweet, it's really telling us what we need to do now. We have to ask all the white questions, all the right questions. Um, we have to know what we want, um, what's serving us and what's not serving us in our lives, because we're even blind to that half the time. Um, we, we just get caught up, we're hypnotized by, sometimes by what's just happening and we don't want to wake up. You know, and you, we just wanna stay hypnotized and plugged in. <laughs> but, you know, it is time to unplug. Um, you know, I've shown you pictures of Amun. He is, he is supposedly the God for this particular cycle. He's the netter, he's the force of nature, the, the four elements, you know, 3D, uh, three-dimensional reality. Um, and yet he's the hidden and we're beginning to see the truth. <laughs> Don't go back to sleep. This is so important. Amun is shown as being plugged in. <laughs> Let's unplug. It's well, there's, there's also so much enticing us back to sleep, whether it's different substances, entertainment, uh, sports, I mean, on and on and on. There's distraction exactly. after distraction after distraction. Like phones, I'm going to turn mine off. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so many distractions. Let's do a, that'll work. Well, that's another thing. I'm as guilty as anyone else of spending too much time on my phone. Well, it's all too easy. There's so much information being fed to us from so many different places. Um, and I'm guilty. I, you know, the phone's, you know, even beside me when I'm relaxing and I hear the little ding and it's like, ah. Oh, you know that I, I almost I sometimes know who it is, and it's I don't have to look at it right away. But well, it's a that. like a Pavlovian response. You're getting that little shot of a, adrenaline or serotonin or whatever it is, dopamine. Well, exactly. And Just like a gambling I, addiction. Yes, um, and and sometimes you feel people expect you to respond right away or whatever it is that you're, you. Know, it's it's just yeah. Mm. Sometimes we just need to put the phones down and get back to nature. <laughs> But we won't do that right now. <laughs> um, this is really a fascinating thing, and I've covered it, um, this diagram in the center. I've covered it with all kinds of arrows and <laughs> circles. and But it's really fascinating because you're looking at, you know, here we have the zodiac again. Um, but we, we have it, and we're looking also at Orion and Ophiuchus. Um, 
And un unfortunately, one of my blue arrows is covering the name of Fucus, but he's right opposite Orion. You can see Orion at the bottom, and I have a picture of the constellation in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and uh, he's in the sky, the Sirius behind him usually, his foot can be on Lepus, but he's right in front of Taurus. Taurus is right over his um, upper right hand, you know, over his head. Um, and so Taurus, as we've said many times, is when we fall into form, and that's the true beginning of Osiris's journey. He looks behind him, see the image in the upper right-hand corner, You've seen this many times if you've been following the podcast. He's looking behind him um, and saying goodbye. He's deciding to fall into form, right? He's leaving that 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 knowing behind. He feels strong. Um, and be, right behind his hand is, is Horus. He's the ascended version of mankind with the double crown. He, he's sitting on the, the erect pillar. Um, and this is that moment of enlightenment. Um, that I'm talking about. And right behind him is the matriarchal um, cycle of uh, depicted here as Sothis, who is also Isis in the mythologies. So it's the feminine, it's, it's the right hemisphere uh, perception of reality. And Osiris is representing as we move into the left um, hand, uh, the left hemisphere perception of reality, um, left framed. Um, and so it's it's sort of like I'm waving goodbye to this, you know, wonderful paradigm and I'm ready to take the hero's journey again. First stop after he he basically you can see he, he's still not wrapped in the mummy wrappings or wrapped in his own wings. He's still, you know, a human being walking. And then as he he goes further and takes his step into Taurus, he falls into form. Um, and he begins his journey. And my blue arrow shows you how that sort of all works as this figure eight um, through the signs. We've seen so many times, but the person who actually posted this um, on social media was offering the idea that maybe there's actually 14 constellations. Um, and again, because they, and so many people are saying a fucus is, is the 13th. And he just is going one step further and saying, oh, well, maybe Orion is the 14th. Um, and I'm just pointing out that we do have these two steps and this is the dynamic and this is the hero's journey. Um, and we don't get there in a linear format. There are curves, there are spirals, and we move in this figure eight and we get to Ophiuchus, who is the serpent bearer, which you can see on the left-hand side, he's the one who has mastered his polarity, his duality. Um, and on top, it's Ophiuchus. And of course, this is Horus as that moment. Horus is the higher aspect of Scorpio, as I've mentioned before, mm -hmm. but he's Scorpio and Ophiuchus, you know, they almost become one at one point because Ophiuchus uh, sits right between Scorpio and Sagittarius and takes up so many days of both of these um, different zodiac peri periods of time. Um, a fucus sits right in the middle and you can see closer to Scorpio. So it's sort of like this fusion of the two. Um, and uh, so I, I, you know, Horus is, he's, he's, he's basically holding serpents, right? And scorpions and <laughs> he is harnessing duality to become at one and there's of course best. So we've seen this all before, but it's another way of looking at it. Um, and again, showing the patterning of how this all works. Um, and here you can see again, um, these, you know, this, uh, 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 this question, are there 14 zodiac signs? Um, and in Egypt, knowing we were in a descending cycle of consciousness, all sexes have had to become one with Osiris. I've mentioned this before as well, upon their, I have death in parentheses, but really it's, you know, leaving the physical. Um, we call it death today. The ancients had no word for that. But meaning when, you know, the meaning night cycle when we are more left brained and asleep, as I was just saying. So our challenge is to wake up and open our hearts in order to find a balance between the heart and mind or the two sides of the brain so that we can move into that stage of complete enlightenment if that's what you're seeking um so again don't go back to sleep because this is this is our moment if we're looking at the patterns and the signs um 
And I love yesterday you were talking about the Taurus and here we have it, you know, so beautifully, um, Alan. Um, this is a, um, a sculpture, I guess you would call it, uh, that was taken um, by Trevor Grassi um, at the Vatican <laughs> Museum. And, you know, when I saw it, I was just, you know, there's that, that hat again, the hat we saw on the Pope <laughs> in several of the last presentations and the cross keys, the golden, you know, the, the golden key and the silver key um, and the portal. And of course, in the center of that portal, you see you sort of like there's the, the, fig, the, the, the image that looks almost like the um, Taurus field um, emanating from the face of the feminine and the three Bs. So it's telling us that this is ninth. This is again, an aspect of sachet. This is the divine feminine patterning, creating the portal, which also um, will become our image for the navel. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, and I've shown this before, but I've, took, <laughs> I've actually took the liberty of putting the red crown and the white crown on the two serpents, just to again um, point out the polarity here. Um, and this, you know, here is that head of Osiris, which is what that cap represents. When the jet pillar is raised, that is what Osiris becomes. He becomes the head, which, of course, was said to have been buried at Abydos, making Abydos this incredibly sacred spot and place of pilgrimage. Um, and so this, the book of the solar Osirian unity speaks about this head and how it's reunited uh, with the formerly mummified body when the sun rises in another new, uh, you know, a new day cycle, the next breath. Um, and the treatises focus on the root of the Eastern horizon, the place of the unification of Ra and Osiris, the final triumph of the nocturnal sun and the Lord of the dead the place of the fiery birth of the newborn son and the final destruction of the damned. All of the enigmatic texts describe and complement the accompanying depictions and often deal with obscure religious concepts. Among these otherwise shadowy beliefs are the inverted entry of the blessed dead into the netherworld and their subsequent writing. The headless form of the blessed dead, um, the uh, kephala, phala, help me, Alan. <laughs> Kephalalios. <laughs> At well, any rate, <laughs> Kepha is means head. So a Kephalios means somebody who doesn't have a head. <laughs> I suppose. Oh, okay, there we have it. Both the head and the person who doesn't have one anymore, um, whose head journeys with the bark of the sun until it's reattached. So yes, the body without the head. Thank you. Um, whose head journeys with the bark of the sun until it's reattached to the mummy at the eastern end of the netherworld. The physically giant form of Osiris and the blessed dead at the eastern horizon, linking and filling heaven and hell. So it's it's actually, in a way, you know, it's a pattern talking, you know, it, it's a story talking about patterns. And in this case, it's uniting heaven and, and uh, earth. You know, we've already pointed out that earth is hell. So it's pointing, it's basically bringing heaven and earth back together again to that point of, you know, zero point of complete unity um, and silence. Um, and it goes on to say the blessed dead can be said to be reborn from the coils of the man snake and from the fiery breath of the serpent as well. Um, and guess who that serpent is? I mean, we've shown the spiral. I'm going to show it again in a moment. But that's. Draco? Hello, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Could it be Draco? <laughs> of course. So we're reborn from what? The ecliptic pole, that place of, that's of centeredness. And As again, it I'm not starts saying... to spin again in the other direction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, Draco going both ways. Um, so it, it's 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 everywhere. The same understanding, but again, we have we're so thousands of years from this time period. So when we read it, we read it as, uh, you know, a story, a legend, a, a pagan ritual, if you will. You know, we don't see the truth behind the story. Um, and all of our ancient cultures, look at look at Australia and how, you know, they, they left their knowing in little songs, you know, songs, poems that were sung, but it holds all of the same knowledge within the, you know, these songs, 
you know, when they talk about song lines, it, it's the same story, just using different words and phrases. Mm -hmm. to and describe. Aboriginal art is mostly <laughs> spirals. <laughs> You know. <laughs> because they knew. Um, and yeah, I've talked about that before, how I've been to Australia and New Zealand and how we saw the and, and spoke, uh, spoke to the locals that knew the legends and how they agreed that it was the same story. Um, I'm, 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 you know, I'm introducing the same thing in order to, you know, it's so hard to grasp and embody knowledge that's been forgotten. And that's why I, you know, so some of you may may think I just keep repeating myself, but I'm not intending to do that. I really want, um, I needed to hear it many times, basically, <laughs> to really let it sink in. So I hope, you know, everybody agrees and understands. Um, so this is something from Laird Scranton, who offers some of these really intricate thoughts and ideas that are sometimes hard. You know, it's hard to stay focused and follow, and yet they hold, you know, what he's offering us is so much really beautiful, um, pertinent information. Um, and here he tells us um, that the Dogon say that the continuum of energy in the universe self-differentiates -differ into domains distinguished by a progressively slowing pace of time. The domains are bounded by points of resonance. And we've talked about, this is what we're talking about. There's these moments of silence between both cycles, points of resonance, which are characterized as resting points. Um, de Broglie tells us that it is these resting points that impose the various stable orbitals of an electron in a hydrogen atom. The Egyptian glyph for resonance is the image of a swallow. And I brought, I, mean, I told you in the last episode we were going to talk about the swallows. Yeah, the wear it um, bird. Exactly. Um, they, yeah, there's another name for it. I think it's called Mehen, um, which I'll mention in a moment. But yeah, it's the bird, it's a bird pictured in a resting state, representing this moment, of course. So here, an ancient Egyptian word for resistance is given in glyphs that read, brings the measure of place of matter to a resting state. The implication is that our observation of the quantum particle, which necessarily disturbs it, imposes resistance that automatically resets its location forward or back to an adjacent point of resonance of its energy, which is the stable situation for it. Oh. So this is again, a pattern of nature. Um, a similar effect is seen in biology where only chemical components of comparable vibration, place of, place of, pace of time, are able to interact. These, these produce byproducts of a slower vibratory pace. In other words, the interaction seemingly moves the resultant to a different point of resonance in the continuum of energy. The implication is that if we know the relationship of the resonant points in a wave of energy, as well as the amount of resistance our act of perception imposes, we ought to be able to accurately predict the particle's new position following our first act of observation. The idea that motion shifts a particle from resonant point to resonant point along a wave of energy provides us with a rationale for motion itself. This is life. And this is the sine wave and the points of resonance are the peaks and the valleys of every sine wave and these sine waves spiral in and out. And this is what I've been showing you over and over. It's the same pattern of nature and it can't be any other way. The glyphs of the Egyptian term for a swallow bird read concept of the place of energy's existence as a spiral. <laughs> so there we go. So, you know, it, it is exactly the same thing. Scientifically, resonance is credited with the formation of spiral galaxies. For the Dogon, vectors of energy emitted from spinning energy at points of resonance define the world spiral. Can't be any other way. The blessed dead can be said to be reborn from the coils of the Mehen snake and from the fiery breath of the serpent as well. In Egyptian love poetry, the swallow heralds the sunrise and the dawn of a new love. So when he comes, when he rests, when he sits for those moments of silence, we know that a dawn of new love is coming. Um, and in this case, he says swallow was uh, depicted as MNT or Manette. 
um, and sometimes referred to as the ba and associated with Isis. Um, and there's the word for swallow on the far right side. So what you were telling me before with the other name, you said merit, where? It, it might, I might be mistaken. It might be two glyphs that look very similar. It's like, it's, it's the where it in the name ta where it. Tauret, you know, it's it's the wear it bird, which means mighty. Ah, so yeah, I think, it, but I think it might be a different glyph. Yeah, we, we'll look at that because they they use so many different birds um, within their symbolism, which makes sense. Um, the birds <laughs> have wings. <laughs> um, so during the old kingdom, sorry here, Jasper. During the old kingdom, swallows were associated with stars and therefore the souls of the dead. Chapter 86 of the Book of the Dead, or the Book of Coming Forth by Day, specifically yeah. instructs the deceased on how to transform into a swallow. See, that, that is our ultimate goal, is to find that moment of silence. And we're told today we can do that through meditation, by finding that silent place within the heart. Um, in Spell 1216 of the Pyramid Text, the Pharaoh describes the swallows as the imperishable stars. Um, and becoming an imperishable star in ancient Egypt was the ultimate, that was the goal. You know, the, the imperishable stars, that's immortality. So. Etymologically, I'm linking MNT to mind, meant. Yeah, that could be. That could be. Well, we see men, men in the name, we actually saw um, men as earth. Mm hmm and then N as um, in motion, which is interesting. So it might be like silence in, 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 in um, the silence before the motion in a way, but not always. Sometimes they just use it because it, it, it gives us the sounds. The yeah, 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 of course. We can skip that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 as far as hieroglyphs, I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, I do the same thing, Alan, and sometimes they are important. And I do believe that they are, that the glyphs they use to create the words are. Oh, yeah, important. actually had meaning beyond just the phonetic Absolutely. value. Um, and, and it can help guide us because multi-level meanings, they, they're only giving us the one, you know, that, that, you know, our translators today are able to interpret, but they're not interpreting with the thought that there's several different depths. Oh, right. In. It's kind of um, like imagine, imagine someone a thousand years from now trying to translate emojis <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> and, and what that particular emoji meant in the context of what you wrote just before it or after. I don't know. Well, now you're absolutely right. And, and why oral and written language fails us in so mm. many ways. Um, and, you know, we're still going to do a podcast on arrival um, and, and speak to how, you know, language becomes a um, uh, a weapon in a way if we a linear language is is almost like a weapon um, because it leads us down paths that don't exist right. um, and we, we don't you know words or words on paper can be taken many different ways but um, I did put this here just to remind you of the swallows that we saw in the last podcast um, from the book of two ways and how these swallows are coming together to the still point, um, just as was just written. Um, it's, it's unity coming from a right brain consciousness. Um, and here is our Mehen snake that uh, was just being talked about. The blessed dead can be said to be reborn from the coils of the Mehen snake and from the fiery breath of the serpent, which Alan so aptly reminded us was Draco. <laughs> um, um, and it is the spiraling motion that provides the experience of a per perception of life. Um, and, you know, I took this other picture from um, uh, the uh, uh, caves at um, very close to Hampi, the, the Badami Caves in India. Um, and I just love this. It was on the ceiling um, and it's showing us um, Pasuki, king of the serpents, um, as as the five hooded um, Naga or Naga Raja, um, and uh, he permits the divas and demons to bind him to Mount Mandara as a churning rope. Remember, he's the serpent that goes uh, back uh -huh. and forth, the spiraling that we were talking about in the last podcast. It's exactly spiraling back and forth, the churning of milk that gives us the elixir 
our Amrita of uh, immortality from the cosmic ocean of primordial waters. So there you have it. It's all in a nutshell. And again, I could say we could stop there. <laughs> no, let's we, do more. <laughs> but we won't. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, so here is that same shape that we were talking about as the head of Osiris, which becomes the Amphalos or um, the, the signature for a world navel. Um, and we do know that both Luxor and Delphi were known as world navels, uh, many different places um, in, in different areas in Peru and, and other places we know are also signified as world navels. Um, and they are for that particular space of land. And in this case, it, it, it's, it's, it's these resonant points or, you know, in a way, they're like, they're like mirrors. They're this place where all the energy emits from one, one point of energy. So again, that zero point. So it's still that same understanding. Um, and the one in, that's in black and white, that is an, an old picture of one for Egypt representing uh, the navel at Luxor. Um, and then the one, the lower one in the, in the right-hand corner, lower right-hand corner is uh, for Delphi and it looks like a beehive, right? Mm. Um, and so Jenny B um, from Bees Used to Be Holy, you know, um, says uh, arguably the most famous Amphalos was the one found at Delphi whose priestesses were said to be called Melissa, mm -hmm. which means you guessed it, bees. Honey bee. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but of course. Melissa. Uh, we know about the queen bees, and here we have Artemis and Knife. Well, they're both Artemis in this case, but it's nice. She was known as the queen bee as well. Um, and so, you know, it's that they, they really are representing, you know, queen bees. Um, and um, they are the ones that weave the world into existence um, through electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. But what's really fascinating is I also discovered um, that there are stories that the Egyptian priests in, in ancient times used to send little birds. Um, maybe they were swallows uh, to the temples in Greece as missionaries. I think in a way the little birds were probably priestesses. Um, and they were sent out to find these places, these portals to create um, the structures that could harness all of the beautiful energy that they possess. Are you saying they were sending Egyptian priestesses that they were yeah. calling little birds, but actual human priestesses? It, this okay. is the way, the minute I read it, I saw, you know, I felt that the, the priestesses were the little birds. They were probably priestesses of Isis. And we see the Isis cults all over uh, Europe and different areas. And you just have this feeling that they were sent out to create, you know, to to begin this these cults of Isis in all these different areas. Oh. Um, spread the missionaries. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's what they call them. So yeah, fascinating. Um, to weave the world into being. Um, and here we have this wonderful swallow, and it's on the bar holding Raharapti, right? Um, and I say, you know, in a way, it, it's we wonder where some of the legends and stories we hear the Noah's Ark story so many different places, um, and they they talk about it coming after the flood. But Sorry. you think, you know, here we are in the bark, right? We're on a bark. Why are we on a bark? <laughs> Since we're on the energy in motion. Um, and possibly, you know, the, the primordial waters. And there's the swallow. And, you know, it looks like Toph could be sending him out to find that place of stillness. What do we see? Horus, the story of Atlantis, um, it, it doesn't say Atlantis, but it's a similar story that we've heard so many times. At Edfu speaks about, you know, the, the, the bird um, after, after the catastrophe, the bird lands on the erect pillar. And, and we see Horus on the erect pillar with the dual crown, that moment of silence. And this is what the swallow represents. So it does sort of connect to a Noah's Ark story. You know, after the flood, after the catastrophe, the bird is sent out to find the first land, that moment that right when we're ready to start another civilization. Um, and at Edfu, they speak of two, so it happens twice. Um, and I sort of always relate that to, you know, the, the, the Jed pillar comes becomes erect, 
of the earth, the spine of the earth, the axis, and, and then um, it falls again. So there's two moments, and the Bennu bird is probably this. It would be the second one that lands. Um, how how would you explain the olive branch that the dove brings back to Noah's Ark? Well, they embellish, they continue on the story. I've also said that the Serapium is a Noah's Ark, you know, for storing DNA and what have you. So <laughs> I think that the, the stories come, we, we've seen in so many different stories and legends and mythologies. Um, you, you, we could talk about North mytholo mythology and it all comes from Egypt. Um, and the, you know, the, the similarities between Egypt and India and so many different places. And they have these stories. And I think as the stories grow and migrate through different cultures and languages, they it changes a little. But I think, you know, Hakeem used to, you know, his eyes would twinkle and he, he used to say, everything came from Egypt. <laughs> you know, I sort of wink. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we'd all laugh and think, all right, he loves his country. But in reality, he, he really meant it. Um, but, you know, I've heard many different, you know, I hear the same story from Australia that, no, everything came from us, you know, and, and I really think it all stems from knowing the patterns. Right. It all came from a common global just knowing. Knowing, exactly. Because a time when we were more right brain than we mm -hmm. are now, because we didn't just go from right brain to left brain. I wish it was that easy because I go running right back again. Right. But it's a migration. It's. You know, it, it, it kind of migrates from one to the other. And that's why we have the four seasons and the, and, and the five cycles. The that's, one, that's the chaos before we hit resonance. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so the swallow also appears in paintings of the solar bark as it enters the underworld where the swallow is usually know, shown on the prow of the boat as the announcer of the sun's approach. Um, sort of like announcing the next the next breath or the next cycle. Mm -hmm. And here we have the swallow again sitting on what looks like an umphalos, right? <laughs> uh, a navel, a moment of silence. Um, and um, that looks like uh, the ak, or it could be a Bennu bird, but it looks like the ak, the light body to me. Um, and uh, at any rate, it's it's there's your lake of fire. It's like all the elements are here for, you know, bringing in the next cycle. Um, and same here. We see the swallow on the far left at the top. Oh, right. Sorry. At the right. And um, as you can see, you know, different images are coming out. It's like the first the sine wave, the walking serpent um, now in motion. So the swallow sets the scene for the next cycle. And then, of course, here we have the two facing inward, and this is our image for Sokar, um, the splendid place at the beginning of time, Zeptepi. His place is Rastau at Zeptepi. This is the Giza Plateau, um, and it's showing us the eternal now moment. You can even see at the bottom the image um, with the wings on the serpent and uh, having two, two different, one has two serpent heads, on one on the right side and um, a human head on the left and uh, in between on sitting on the ochre. So it's showing and there's Sokar as that image that forms the pyramid above that, you know, his head showing that moment of no time and no space at Zeptepi. And the little head of the scarab beetle is coming out of the Amphalus or that even that you could call that the head of Osiris. Uh, the moment of complete stillness, he's coming out to begin the next cycle. Um, just as Sokar, I always kind of think Sokar is pregnant with all the infinite potentials um, because the next breath, of course, is Horus emerging as the new cycle of the sun. And here it's all shown so beautifully. Um, and, and this is a pen and ink drawing of the festival of Sokar at Dar el Medina, um, uh, the workers village in Luck on the West Bank of Luxor. Um, and again, I, I, I talk about, you know, the story that begins with the fall of Atlantis as sort of tongue in cheek that this is, you know, if we're looking at the bark in the red circle, that's Sokar. You see the little like um, falcon head with the... <laughs> solar disk on top that is the silent sun <laughs> you 
you know, he, he, there is no movement and he, his head is literally coming out of a shape just like the Omphalos again. Um, and it's it's the silent moment and that bark, we see this at, at Abydos too when I talk about it. It's the silent sun and it has to be pulled on a sled, you know, and there's our Christmas story. There's Santa Claus on a sled in a way um, because it the, he, he, can, he does not move himself. He is silent. Um, and it also can represent our solstices, that moment, those three days when we have, you know, the solstice means the still or silent sun. Um, and then after three days, the next cycle begins, Horus is born. Um, but after that, there you see on the pillar is Horus sitting on the pillar um, or the bird on the, the papyrus pillar with, you know, the um, serpent rising um, as that again moment where you know he's not wearing it but he can wear the double crown um before the next breath and there you see the new cycle of the sun there is anubis who if you remember comes you know he he comes out on the myrrh from taret's belly in the center of the zodiac to as the path opener of the next cycle um in the age of cancer on the dendera zodiac so he's the path opener for the next cycle of the sun um, and behind him is a moon plugged in um, and uh, he's basically seeding the next cycle mm -hmm. so isn't that amazing wow and so it, it's, it's, all right so, there. it's all right there you know um <laughs> it, it's it's really beautiful and i love how anubis is pre presenting the new sun um it's really it's really just beautiful so this is uh, from the newly cleaned um, Osiris Chapel. Uh, they, they, they're cleaning everything. This is from Dendera. Um, and these images used to be almost impossible to see. They were all covered in soot. Um, and I was just there this past December um, during, I, I was there to see the, the solstice sunrise at Karnak and uh, went with a friend to visit many of the temples and they're just doing wonderful things at these temples. But here we're looking at uh, the resurrection of Osiris, all the scenes that are involved in that. And this one, you can see the swallows um, mm -hmm. because this is that moment of potential when just before he, he rises um, in the resurrection scenes. And you see uh, Isis and Nebhet on either side without their wings, so wings are down. He's laying on his back, but there's a potential for the next breath. Um, and that can even be, you know, it could be a kite bird or it could be swallow all over him. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, in a way he, he you've got his, uh, you know, that world navel, this that moment of nothingness and all the potentiality that exists within it. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I bring these pictures, that moment when every, you're facing outward, that's the beginning of the next cycle, and then we come to the close um, at the end again. Um, and these images, I see these everywhere. These, the, the ones at the top are from a papyrus um, from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, but you see that image everywhere, and you see basically the bird, the hawk, inside the upside down omega shape of the two serpents and i um the, the 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 two crowns are actually there these you can see now that that um Nekbet and wajit are two sides of the same thing mm -hmm. they're not two separate serpents it's the double-headed serpent um and this is that moment you know in a way we're looking at that magnetic equator on earth and it's upside down and backwards from and, and this is why i turned hathor's head upside down because she represents the the womb the omega of the primordial waters above and we're upside down and backwards so you could actually see um how that works that's why i played with the image and turned it upside down so um really fascinating as above so below and then I bring back again, you know, I saw these images, people don't know what these images, these Z, these Z curves and, and different Pictish images you see in Scotland and they, they talk about different theories about what they can mean. 
Um, but I immediately saw the omega symbols and I saw the, 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 the two directions. <laughs> Um, and of course, the serpent and the spiral um, and the sun and it, it all it's all to me, you know, even look at that one bottom one on the left hand side and you see the two suns. So clearly. It, it, yeah. And, and it, it actually shows us the two directions, you know, the dual opposing spins. So really fascinating. And here we go. Um, Osiris is now turned over. Horus has told him to turn over and rise. Um, so another image, we still see the swallows. And you can see all the culbras at top. On top of this, you know, structure that he's in, he's in a shrine before he rises. And it's noting a moment again. We're still not totally awake yet. But he, he has turned over and um, he is in a very sacred area, space, if you will. Um, and now on the far right, you see Osiris and he's on the sled. Look how clean these images are. It's just beautiful. Um, he's on the sled. So again, he's, he's not moving himself, but all of this is happening. And he's about to go through the lotus and papyrus pillars. He's about to go through <laughs> the pillars of Boaz and, jo and, and Joachim, right? And fall into form. Wow. So in the next image, there is Isis and her wings are down and they're about to come up as he is rising from within the Taurus field that is beginning to spin. Um, and that's life. So Osiris is resurrected, enjoys a moment of silence and moves through the portal to be born into duality again. He's born again. Um, and he's being presented. It's hard to see, but I have a blue circle around the Ankh. It's the gift of life. He's being born again, the resurrection scene. Um, he emerges again as the magnetic field or veil of Isis rises to, and, and the veil of the magnetic field or veil of Isis rises to protect him. Um, because if we are alive, we are surrounded with this magnetic field, which is conscious, holds our consciousness as well. This is the patterning of life. There is no death. And these resurrection mythologies become legends and mythologies worldwide. Um, and I, I shouldn't say become because they exist everywhere because this is the ancient knowing. Um, and these are the patterns of nature as well. Um, and so, yeah, I was just at Karnak and I, I always love to visit and I had time this time to go visit the, uh, the Temple of Osiris Hekjet at Karnak, which is way, way, way in the back. Um, it's a small little chapel and it has these seven gates. And every time I see it, I go, you know, this little ditty, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven. You know, where do those little ditties come from? But from this ancient knowing, the seven gates that we go through, the seven uh, qualities of energy, um, our seven chakras. You know that you know all of those gates that Anubis is standing at, you know, and and asking us, are you really think you're ready to come through? <laughs> you know, and he's the one that says, okay, you know, you know you're ready to go to the next level. Um, and right next to those gates, and I know you can't see it, but it's there. There is the uh, fetish of Osiris, this this symbol of the head of Osiris on the side of the seven gates. Um, so it's showing, you know, this this beautiful. That's the portal that we walk through, um, and and come back out again. Um, the Book of Two Ways was the first example of the map of the underworld in ancient Egypt. The two paths represented are the terrestrial and fluvial routes, separated by a lake of fire, which lead to the abode of Osiris. It describes the existence of seven gates with guardians or demons in each one. The first is a door of fire protected by a guardian called the one who rejects the ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> now, right, again, right away. This is the translator's interpretation, but what, you know, it, 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 lack of knowledge is, is sin, right? <clears throat> so ignorance is, you know, that's why we're rejected. We haven't figured it out. You know what anyway. this reminds me of? Uh, sorry, it just reminded me of the, uh, the first scene in Squid Game. I don't know if you saw that. It was very popular. It was yeah. very, very, very bloody. But in the first scene, <laughs> <I wasn't seeing> it. 
Right. In the first scene, almost everybody gets murdered <laughs> out of <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> you know, it's the, the first test and they're told what to do and nobody does it and they all die. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll skip that part, but it's just. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing. <laughs> But, but that's then, it. I mean, if if you, you you arrive there and you're ignorant and don't know what to do, what are you? What's going to happen? You know, they'll send you right back, reincarnated. Well, that's exactly right, um, and that's why this knowledge is so important. <laughs> so anyway, I heard someone first... say that when you're going through the tunnel towards the light, you should go any way up, down, left, right, backwards, but don't but go good. into the light. Yeah, because that's in, that instant well. reincarnation. Go deeper into the darkness. I talk oh, about just, that a lot. Yeah, just like Kamumbo. Go yep, farther exactly. down, 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 past the past the crocodiles, past your exactly. fears. Keep going. Mm. The only way out is through. Yep, that's right. We have to face our demons. But okay, so the first <laughs> door. The first is a door of fire protected by a guardian called the one who rejects the ignorant which prevents the passage of those who have no knowledge and once crossed offers two alternatives towards the light or towards the world. <laughs> I didn't even read yeah. that part, but <laughs> well, we were just talking about <laughs> um, <laughs> fascinating. Only the pure can go around the guardians and advance without being trapped in absolute darkness, nothingness to the kingdom of full light presided over by Raharis, the ancient, who is the divine light itself. Well, that's actually the opposite of what I just said. It is the opposite, but yet again, it makes you, it, there's so many things that make me wonder. Um, this is an ancient, the book of two ways is middle kingdom. So that takes it back. Um, and then you wondered, you know, so many things we've lost so much knowledge and things have been twisted by the Hanudi. So you wonder what's real and what's not. I think the really ancient stuff is real, but you notice how it says only the pure can go around guardians. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of going the direction where everybody's waiting at the tunnel of light. <laughs> um, I think you have to, to, to go your own path and advance without being trapped in absolute darkness mm -hmm. and nothingness to the kingdom of full light. And again, you know, how we interpret the kingdom of full light could be totally different. So this is a wonderful image. I have a couple here of um, the judgment scene. And we talked about it before, the weighing of the heart against the feather. Um, but this one shows you the seven chakras as part of this weighing of the heart and mind. It's it's really, that it is what it is. It's, it's really showing how you've, um, brought the two hemispheres of your brain, your two focuses together um, to transmute your polarity. Because if we're too left-brained, we're out of balance. If we're too right-brained, we're out of balance. But it's really bringing the two, harnessing the energy of both the heart and mind. Um, because we can't be totally mindless. Because <laughs> then we're totally ignorant, right? We're not going to get through the gates. Um, these seven gates that are shown here so beautifully. So, you know, here are our seven gates um, and they're showing us it's the root, the sacral, the solar plexus. plexus. Um, and it's even saying one thing, you know, the root is grounding. We have creativity, power, love, our articulation, uh, intuition. And of course the crown is universal consciousness, you know, and that's what we're, you know, the ultimate is becoming one that all that is, you know, in the primordial waters. Um, and then coming back with that great knowing um, or moving forward or moving to other dimensions of knowing. Um, I don't think we have to come back here. I think, you know, we, we have many opportunities and um, many possibilities, infinite possibilities for creating something different. Um, but yeah, isn't this wonderful? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now I can see the screen. <laughs> so this is uh, the Greenfield Papyrus in the British Museum. So yeah, it, fascinating. Um, and you saw, if you saw at the very top is uh, Jehudi 
um, Toth as the baboon, and he he represents basically the heart um, of you know heart based consciousness or going within consciousness from within. Mm -hmm. And um, in this case, we have Anubis here, and Mati is the dual uh, images of Mat. It, it's known as Maati. So here I'm just showing you, there is the beautiful image of the baboon, um, and here are these chakras. And what's interesting is there, is there is a tone or sound associated with each one of the chakras. So as you, you move up, um, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing them wrong, but Lam, Bam, Ram, Yam, Ham, Om, and then the top, universal consciousness is silence. Interesting. <laughs> And, and again, this comes out of, you know, the ancient Vedic texts and from Hinduism and from India, and it's the same knowing. Um, because here we have the baboons sitting in silence, waiting for the sun to rise again. Hmm. Enlightenment. <laughs> so here again is another image of Jehuti's caduceus or Toth's caduceus. Um, and you can see the chakras are actually on um, the center uh, between the heart and the mind of the scales hmm. uh, with Anubis's head at the top, the path opener. And as I said before, Anubis is also known to be standing at each one of the gates of your chakras. And, and he's basically saying, you know, you know, are you ready to open the gate of the path toward cosmic consciousness? Um, and I love, there's again, your image of um, Jehuti. Amit. Well, Amit's always there. And we mm. talked about her as possibly a version of Tarette. Right. Um, because she, she is basically... Oh, the, ready to digest your form back into well, of course. physical reality. Right. That, that's re that's digestion. Yes. reincarnation if you fail the task. <laughs> well, yeah, happy, to, happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> Crocodiles are always waiting in the crocodile pit, right? <laughs> and we're laughing about a well at uh, Kamambo. Um, and we're going to do podcasts on all the temples and we'll go into, you know, a lot. Of, we'll talk about a lot of these things during those podcasts. But, um, yeah, the crocodile pit was a place where you learn to overcome your fear because the crocodiles are waiting. <laughs> um so at any rate, uh, yeah, that we have uh, Jehuti or Toth as the baboon sitting on the side of the heart again, um, which represents, of course, our right brain consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, consciousness from within. And uh, the feather on the other side would represent consciousness of um, the left brain consciousness from above or the mind. Um, and I saw this, I'd never seen this before, but now that it's cleaned, this is a wonderful image of, again, the baboon sitting on what could be a papyrus or something um, in front of the erect jet pillar. Um, just beautiful. Um, and so the centered heart is the engine that drives the electromagnetic Taurus field. This field sustains the spin of all the chakras. So of course he is part of that process sitting on the top of the scales uh, or sitting um, in front of it. Um, it the, the, you know, this is what we're being asked to do is find that centeredness in our heart, which um, I also believe is what Nebhet represents. She is the heart um, and the engine that drives the electromagnetic Taurus field. And, you know, as I, I, I mentioned before, I saw this wonderful YouTube video of Manly P. Hall talking about how important this Taurus field was and how important it was to the ancients of Egypt, but also maintaining the health of our Taurus field is so important. And it couldn't be more important right now. Um, and keeping it in balance um, is, is what will carry us through. Um, Which basically the, means keeping your body healthy. Exactly. Well, exactly. Your body, mind, and spirit. It's its all of the above. It's not just um, making sure you take the right supplements and working out. It's also keeping a balanced mind and heart. It, it's all of those things. Um, whole, holistic health. 
Um, but I, I just brought this back because I know we've talked about it before, but there you have, and, and probably I'll talk about it again, but there you have the image on the far right of um, Jehudi as the baboon sitting on the erect pillar um, because that's that moment of heart-centeredness. And then as we move across <clears throat> to the other side, the pillar falls the 23.5 degree angles. So again, showing us these cycles of life with the field of our vision inside, you know, the, um, the eye inside the field of vision or the net, the matrix. And this says it all too. This is from Roslyn Chapel. Um, uh, we missed the R there, must have gone behind the picture, but you're seeing two images from Roslyn Chapel and I just love the, the, the symbolism from Roslyn. But on the left side, you know, that's basically left brain consciousness. We fall into form, into the container. And here you have a rope wrapped around the angel. We are angels that fall into form, right? We are light beings and we've forgotten that we're light beings. But of course, I, I found this other beautiful angel and she's holding the heart, you know, at, at her solar plexus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, our, our center sun, but it, it's, it's heart-based consciousness from within. It's, again, that same understanding. Um, and in the last uh, presentation, we showed the image on the right of this, you know, Buddha figure on top of Draco with the two heads, um, but um, and with the seven-headed uh, Naga on top, Bess in the center, of course, but at... Um, Anchor Wat, you see this wonderfully beautiful Naga, um, and you can actually see the sun on its chest, right? But you have that center one, you know, which again is exploded. It's in the center with the, the three um, smaller Nagas on either side, serpents, um, as seven expressions of this patterning of life. Which again, here we have Draco. <laughs> Um, a more realist, well, that, it's really a cartoonish picture, but um, Draco, as it sh it's shown in the heavens with the seven pole stars, because these are also related to those seven special, you know, the seven chakras, the seven classical planets. These are archetypal energies of our, our patterning of how, you know, what time is it, what state of consciousness we, you know, are we in? The seven gates of our great year. Um, as well, and th this is the so this is, these are all circumpolar stars um, playing out all of the stories um, that we talk about in ancient Egypt and other places in the world, as above, so below. <clears throat> and also, I wanted to point out because it, it's really fantastic. As you go into the temples in Egypt, they're all telling the same story in different ways with different. Um, in the, each one may be revering a different archetypal netter, you know, one to Hattor, one to Isis, one to Sobek, and so on. But they all have similar um, symbolism um, as telling part of this greater story. Um, and it, it's, it's really fantastic. They're all telling the story that I'm, I'm speaking about in, in different ways, but they're all connected. And this is a, a room at Dendera in, in the back. Um, in the very back, some think it's the Holy of Holies. It has a little ladder up to a, a beautiful little um, sort of inner shrine. Um, and it's, it's, it's called sort of like people call it the Chamber of Sound. Um, and it's, it's actually, in a way, it's the, the place of resonance and new beginnings. It's, it's everything we're talking about. And on either side of the doorway, if you look to the far right and the far left here, we have two netters, feminine netters, and it's neck, bet, and wajit. And each one is holding one of the rods, um, staffs that we see Jehuti holding both of them at, at Abydos. I have him in the center here. But it, that's not the only place you see those images. And that's what I want to point out that these stories, people tend to look at each temple and every image is something separate, but they're all connected. And here we're in this beautiful chamber and it's speaking about the coming together of these two, um, the, the white and the red crown, the two energies that they represent, the two serpents within our Kundalini, the Caduceus itself. 
because each one of those rods is being held by these two netters, Wajit and Nekvet. Um, and I did put the caps on because it's hard to see these two images. Uh, you know, the, the rooms are now clean, but they're still, the images are so light, they don't photograph well. But they are wearing these two crowns. And of course, at the doorway is where they come together in the center. And the whole room is about coming back to resonance. And it's, it, it really is just a beautiful way of showing it. And of course, this isn't the only place you'll see it. Um, and I showed you this in the last podcast as well. And I, I just want to bring it back because here again, you see Moot with her wings around Nekvet and Wajit with the double, with the two different crowns, the red and the um, white crowns, um, representing upper and lower Egypt, but also again, the two hemispheres of the brain, the right brain and left brain. Um, and this is just a really beautiful image um, from the Leiden Muse Museum in Holland. And you see neck better moot, and she's spreading her wings to protect a man, um, a, a king who's meditating. I mean, isn't that just beautiful? Wow. Um, in, in that moment of silence. Um, and, you know, she's known as mother of mothers who have existed from the beginning and is the creatrix of the world. Nekvet's pre-dynastic cult reached far back in time, pre-dynastic, with her image appearing on the aim scepter, which is the mace of the club of the very first Egyptian king, Narmer. Um, but isn't this beautiful? And I've always said that Mut represents that moment. Um, it's where our word mother comes from, but she's moot. She does not need to speak um, because she knows. Heart well, and the vulture moot is synonymous with the counter of Sekhmet moot, correct? Sitting, yes, sitting in her power. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The sitting Sekhmet's um, aspects of each other, but the sitting Sekhmet is moot. She's sitting in her power. Sekhmet is standing because she's an active force of nature. She, they both represent mothers of mothers, but one would be, you know, the protected love of the mother, and the other would be the fierce love of the mother that will rage and roar at anything that threatens her child, right? And in that case, her child is is the earth protecting nature itself, the netters. Um, so, and we're, we'll talk about her in upcoming presentations more as well. Um, so here again, you see this separation and unification of the two hemispheres of the brain as these stats of, of Toth. Um, and of course, Toth is consciousness. And at the, at the top, you know, each one of these cobras is sitting on the lotus and papyrus. This is all part of the story. So, you know, we see these lotuses and papyruses everywhere representing the masculine and feminine charge. Uh, um, upper and lower Egypt, the two hemispheres of the earth, the two hemispheres of the brain. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a pattern of nature that, um, you know, they're trying to get across to us. This is how nature is patterned. It can't be any other way. It can't Dual be any other way. <laughs> it can't be. There is a dual opposing wave spin of conscious perception caused by the spiraling in and out of a Taurus field that flips. Magnetics will flip. Um, and here again, just to point out, here is the, the rise, raising of the Jed pillar. And we see our, our neck bet and wadget inside the sun disk that's on this pillar that is conscious. The two eyes come together in the center. And so do these two um, serpents uh, from the Caduceus. So this is, you know, the consciousness has, you know, gotten through all the seven gates and has reached uh, the head chakra for that moment of silence before the next cycle, the next breath. Um, and you know it's silent. Here, here, here the uh, SETI one is offering the linens and um, they're not moving. Um, if they're moving, you know there's motion, but they're not moving. Um, and again, I've shown this before. Maura Tim's um, from the stud from her studies at Edfu uh, speaks to this moment as the ending of one world age and beginning of another. And of course, that's what it is. And this raising of the Jed pillar is the ritual itself is 
celebrated annually. So again, speaking of a cyclical falling and rising. It's also celebrated at the King's Hepset rituals, which are celebrated, they say, you know, at the 33rd year of his reign, many of the pharaohs and kings wanted to have more because it was this, you know, incredible time of celebration and proof that he had the right to rule. Um, so they would go through these rituals and we will do full podcasts on the Hepset because it's emulating everything we're talking about with the cycles. Hello, Jasper. <laughs> if you can hear him crying. Mommy, you've been doing this long enough. <laughs> and here again, this is from a beautiful little chapel uh, to Isis. It's a little temple to Isis on the West Bank that I visited um, in December as well um, of last year. And um, on either side, and I'm talking about, again, the right and the left sides, you often see the lotus and the papyrus with the serpent rising. So again, here we have that caduceus energy um, and the energy, you know, that's within us, the kundalini energy that we've been talking about um, beginning in the last podcast and, and before. Um, and at the top of each one, you actually see uh, the image of the vulture of Nekbet and the cobra of Wajit. And this, this, we find this in, in all the temples. Um, in, in, in specific chambers. And it, it's just wonderful because it's showing you, you know, the separation and the coming together of these two energies that also exist within us. Um, and I put this in here again, this was found on social media. Um, but it, 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 it <laughs> we've talked about it before, how this all occurs within us. Because again, force of nature, it's happening. These are patterns of nature, the netter, the netter. Um, and there you see Santa Claus or Bess at the top, right? At the crown, at the um, erect pillar. <laughs> um, and also, you know, they have the Holy Grail at the top. And from my knowing and inner knowledge, the Holy Grail is always at the heart. It's at the center of um, basically our heart chakra or our uh you know our consciousness lies in that center and it's emanating out in my opinion so we're seeking the holy grail but it's within um and when we find the heart-based consciousness it allows us to rise to that higher level um to meet santa claus or beth if you will um but i love on either side they're showing you the two sides the two serpents and one relating to the pineal, um, uh, the honey, the solar, the male energy, Shiva, Joseph, it's electric, it's shoe energy, right? Um, and the other side is the pituary gland, uh, milk, lunar, female, shak Shakti, Mary, magnetic, you know, all of these things. And again, we've talked about these things, but it, it's kind of nice to see them all in one image. Um, and notice how they show the hour, or the arrows going down and going up, uh, because it can't be any other way. <laughs> it's yin and yang. Um, and this is a lovely, again, a wonderful image, one of my favorite ones from Abydos, um, because it, it, in, the, in the room right next to the resurrection scene, you have an image dedicated to the netter um, that is... Uh, speaking to heart-based consciousness. And this is Nefertum. And Nefertum is basically, we've talked about Atum being the atom, representing, again, left brain cycle of consciousness, warrior archetype, the atom, the, the duality, um, and, and, and separation consciousness. And here we have Nefertum. And Nefertum it, it is, is the child that Pata and Sekhmet give birth to after the moment of silence, her three days when she passes out from being drunk um, from the Nile that uh, had been turned to, to uh, beer or wine um, or even the Red Sea. Um, but she sees this, she gets drunk, she passes out for three days, then moments of silence. She sees Pata, gives birth to Nefer, Tum, and Nefer means harmony. It's where we have Nefertiti and, and Nefertari. They walk in harmony. Um, and here we have this, this harmony of the atom, meaning heart-based consciousness. 
mm. um, and we spin the other direction. And you can see that the eye of consciousness is placed at the heart, it's left eye, <laughs> because it can't be any other way. Um, and it's showing a new cycle because you see the hawk on his head and that is his crown with the lotus. The new sun is risen. In a way, you could say Christ consciousness. Um, I heard you say this yesterday. So it is the same thing. Um, different time period, different terms. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, Jasper, but you're covering my screen. <laughs> Sorry, folks. So here again, we see another wonderful image of Nekbet and um, uh, well, actually they're Nebhet and Isis, but you can also say they're Nekbet and Wajit because it's always going to be same, the same energy with the two serpents. But in this case, they're, they're actually showing it as Neb, Neb, Nebhet and Isis as dual aspects of night or the fabric of our reality as well. But you can see that they are aspects of Nice because you see the image of Nice's crown on the cobras. Mm -hmm. And this is from China. <laughs> so again, I put the red and I took the liberty of putting the red and white crown on their heads, but you see the masculine and the feminine. Um, and it's the same dynamic dance uh, within our DNA um, because they do, you know, in this case, they're, they're showing the image of DNA. In a way, it's also, if you look at it, um, Alan, it's showing the saw twisted. Like, <laughs> we move one direction and then move the other. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, isn't that wild? Wow. Um, yeah. And I could talk about that because it has the sun and the moon on it as well. <laughs> so it's actually, and, and that does show the analemas. So fascinating, right? It's all connected. That's that's why the Sa is so important. The Analema is so important because it's showing this same patterning. Um, but uh, here they say compass square and double helix. Um, and this comes from um, a Chinese mythology. Uh, in, Chi in Chinese tradition, yin and yang are often depicted by Fuxi and Nuwa. <laughs> and Nuwa stands for heaven with a round compass, while Fuxi symbolizes earth with a square ruler. So there we have the square, the box of earth. Um, and creation. Um, the male is the yang on the left and the female is the yin on the right. Huh, wonder where they got that. <laughs> right brain, left brain. The sun as the yang at the top and the moon is the yin at the bottom. So again, same knowing, there's your yin yang. Um, as for the entangled tails of the couple, they look uncannily like a double helix of a DNA, which of course was only discovered in 1958 or rediscovered. Um, so yeah, and, and this is more than a thousand years old. So just beautiful. Right brain, left brain. Um, and here I have on the far left, you have Nekbet and Wajit and the coronation of a king. Um, and so they're crowning him with the dual crown because he went through the headset ritual that I was talking about. And, and he was able to find that moment of silence, become one with universal consciousness and bring that gnosis, that energy, that knowing, that power of God down to earth. And he gets to be crowned with the double crown of upper and lower Egypt, the two hemispheres of the brain, because he's harnessed the energy of both and sits on the throne um, and is crowned as a Horus king. And of course, Horus being the rebirth. When they die, they become one with Osiris. And when they rise, you know, with the opening of the mouth tool shaped like the Big Dipper, because it's all about <laughs> timing, right? It's symbolism. Um, and they're brought back to life. Um, that next cycle, they become Horus. And that's where we get the whole concept of our God sitting on a throne. It goes back to these rituals <laughs> that were performed. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Wow. Who knew? <laughs> so, and we've talked about it before, but again, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to keep seeing these things when you have a more full understanding of it. There's Horace with the double crown, and of course, watch it wearing the double crown. Um, it's the symbol of, you know, it's the symbol we've been talking about of enlightenment. Um, it's the coming together of the two powerful ones 
and the double crown is called the shemt or the sekem t sekem meaning power mm -hmm. dual power so it's basically the power of both hemispheres of the brain that's pretty cool wow yeah <laughs> <laughs> So now you know what these terms mean and it has it really has a depth of meaning um and it's also telling us you know what's happening today um and here's another beautiful image of um it's seti the first receiving the lotus and papyrus scepters from mood at karnak um so again same imagery at different temples it's it, you don't just see it one place um, and it's only significant to one story. These are woven throughout all of the knowing and mythology because it is one story um, of the patterning of life. And this is a really cool image. I, I did send a copy of this to you, Alan, um, because I found it so fascinating and I really wanted to study it. I'd never seen it before, but it was in that chapel um that i was talking about that's dedicated to, to harmonic resonance and sound mm -hmm. and this king with the dual crown is offering and out of the corner of my eye I, it looked like the sumerian sun disc right mm -hmm. but when of course when i looked closer i was like whoa what is that and i saw the lotus and the papyrus coming out of either side um, and, you know, it's, it's either side of a Shen symbol, mm -hmm. right? So this offering is, is infinity. It's the infinity of these cycles. And it has the sun disk on top um, showing, you know, this moment. Um, and inside, I did send this to a friend who is a um, Egyptologist here in Egypt. Um, you know, a really wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and... Uh, he told me that the, uh, I wasn't sure of the shape um, and it, it sort of, you know, wasn't a clean oval, but it, it is an egg and underneath it is an eyebrow, which I thought, you know, wow. And he said it meant protection. So I did some research because it sort of looked familiar to me. Um, and I found this image of the brain and I, it, it all sort of makes sense because we're talking about consciousness, harmonic resonance coming into that moment of, of, of oneness. And I thought this had to be somehow shown. And it really sort of makes sense because the, the thalamus is sort of called, it, called like an egg, it's shaped like an egg, right? Um, and the thing is, it's surrounded by the neocortex, which controls a person's language and consciousness, right? Um, and it's all about sensory perception. So all information from your body senses. And, and remember, Hakeem said we have originally, you know, 360. We have this full circle sensibility that we forgot we have. Um, but they all have to be processed through your thalamus before being sent to your brain's cerebral cortex for interpretation. Your thalamus also plays a role in sleep, wakefulness, consciousness, learning, and memory. So in a way, it all happens there. Um, and when it's totally awake, that would be that moment of silence, right? Um, so, may, yeah, I could be totally wrong. But it really kind of all makes sense. So, and again, you know, you, you can look at it. I, I ha On one of my group tours last year, I had a, an incredible, she was a doctor, um, and she could see the symbolism um, within our body of almost everything we were looking at. And she was just wild everywhere we went, Patricia, Patricia, you have to see this. And, you know, she would come back with the books and the pictures and see, there it is. So she has me beginning to look for these things. So, again, I'm not saying this is what it is, but I think there's a connection with, again, there's always a connection with what's happening within. Um, and of course, lotus and papyrus representing the two hemispheres of the brain, it all seems to come together, but just offering it as a, a possibility. Um, but again, that, that, um, that Shen symbol, that infinity symbol is Hattor's hair, the omega symbol. It's tied up with rope. And when the rope is released, the gate opens and the flood of primordial waters is of consciousness come out to provide our perception or, you know it's it's where co consciousness can divide into all the separated aspects of self 
um, to experience itself. Um, so again, it all makes sense to me. <laughs> Um, and this wonderful image on the left is showing you again the sun and the moon and the eye consciousness in the center. So in the center of the two, day and night um, and, and cycles lies the centeredness of consciousness. The heart is always in the center. And that is what we are encouraged to return to. Um, Here's Naga the Cobra as a symbol of kundalini power, cosmic energy coiled and slumbering within man. It inspires seekers to overcome misdeeds and suffering by lifting the serpent power up the spine to God realization. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, you know, we know this, but it's to see the symbolism played out. In, in this patterning of cycles and know that this is what we're experiencing. We experience this in every day, in every year, and of course, every great year. Um, and I love that once you know the pattern, you know what to expect and what's coming next. Um, and, and we're gonna get you know a lot deeper into what's coming. This moment in time is this powerful moment that, that this is all expressing. And I think they left it for us so that we would know how to walk through it. Um, and again, that wonderful image uh, on the head, they have different ways of expressing it, but it's the dual opposing wave spin of these two serpents. Um, and uh, it indicated the awakened Uraeus, the spiraling of Kundalini up the spine, opening the seven sealed chakras and the third eye, bringing forth self-realization and higher consciousness. There you have it, enlightenment. Everything breathes in a spiraling motion in and out of the heart of creation. There's your, your winged um, hourglass. And it hourglass, what does it do? In the minute the, 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 um, the salt or the power of the granules go from one side to the other, it turns over within this spiraling motion of Draco. <laughs> Our holy grail is within. And it's this. This is what the symbolism is talking about. This is the raising of the jet pillar. Within and without. We showed this image before in the last podcast. And again, you know, the key to opening this is resonance, unification. Unification is the key to opening the portals to higher dimensions. We need to start remembering that we are all part of the one and stop fighting with each, stop being angry with each other and start realizing we're all on the same journey back home um, to that moment of complete bliss. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a cycle, it's a journey of perception. So everything we think, people are threatening us with is all an illusion in so many different ways. And when we can realize that, you know, everything outside ourselves is an aspect of ourself, we'll stop fighting with it and start trying to resolve the friction and the chaos. That's the key. This shows you, <laughs> again, part of the Hebset ritual. You can see the king is thrown with both the red and the white, and then with both the double crown. Um, Luxor Temple, they say, is all about portraying the divinity of the king. And this, of course, is Ramses II in all his glory. Um, and you see all these huge statues of him with the double crown because he has <laughs> achieved that moment of complete bliss and enlightenment. Um, it, it, the same patterning is shown within, you know, all of the rituals of royalty within every expression and breath within the mythology, within the flooding of the Nile, the seasons of the year, what's happening in the heavens and within us. How much clearer can it get? <laughs> We've shown this before. And even at the temples, they're all laid out in the Sima Taui patterning. Here on the far right left, you can see the Lotus and Papyrus pillars. 
on either side of the Holy of Holies at Karnak. And inside Holy of Holies is where heaven meets earth. <laughs> it's insane. So right, heaven, because the, the ceiling and the floor come together. <laughs> exactly, because the ceiling keeps rising, the heavens, well, the, 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 the ceiling, sorry, it keeps coming down. The floor is the earth keeps coming up as you walk through the temple. And when you get to the Holy of Holies is where heaven meets earth. And it gets even better. So, so here, as I said, every temple is laid out in this pattern of the Sema Tawi, the breath of life. It's, it's, they utilize the specific rocks and minerals and sacred geometric patterns that make it alive. It's breathing in and out in the Sema Tawi Taurus field pattern. It's, it's, it's a great breath of life. And the key is to make it through the seven gates, the seven chakras, to get to the holy of holies, where heaven meets earth. Enlightenment. The breath of uh, uh, on earth begins at Zeptepi with Tefnut. We said it in the last the last podcast as the spit of Newt. She faces east to meet the sunrise in the age of Leo. And in December of last year, I came back and finally, you know, after 11 years, got to see the rising of the sun and the winter solstice down what I call the Scargate path or the center path of Karnak Temple. And it was just incredibly powerful to be there. We were the first ones there and we get into the temple and we kind of sort of race so we can get to the best place, you know, at the Holy of Holies to see this powerful moment, you know, and, and to the ancients, they all gathered for these moments because the sun is basically kissing you to create the next cycle. And it, it, I, it, I can't explain it, but all of us that were there felt how powerful it was to have that moment of darkness. And as the sun comes up, it literally touches your face and it, it, it ignites something within you. Um, incredibly power, powerful. Um, and I put this image of the, the bark with the lotus and the serpent coming out because this is that moment, right? The serpent comes out into the lotus bulb, right? We, in, in the crypt, we see that first breath of the cosmos into the lotus bulb as the serpent. And that's the sun rising on these, you know, at the solstice, that moment of silence to create that first breath. Um, and and Sa-Ra, by the way, I mentioned this in the last podcast about Sa-Ra and, and Abraham, but I forgot to mention that Sa-Ra also means the son of Ra, mm. as that same liquid light coming out of the lotus, the sun walking on water to touch your face and ignite the next cycle. It's, it's just, I can't describe it. So I bring this back as a reminder for those that may not have seen the last podcast, where we talked about Sara, right? Um, the, the, the birth of the sun um, as being the fluid life force, as the breath of the great central sun, as, as being um, Sarah from the Bible and Ibrahim uh, being the beam from the heart of the sun um, as the great father and mother uh, at the first breath of life on earth. Um, and here we have, you know, from inside the Holy of Holies, I have the picture on the far, far left. And inside it, there would have been a bark sitting on that, that they call it an altar. I call it a seed stone. Um, that bark would have been sitting there with the golden va or image of a netter sitting inside waiting for that you know if they would have brought these barks out of out of storage and placed them there and purified the images of, of the netter you know the archetypal force of nature that it represented and waited for that sun to rise on the solstice to touch and ignite that energy back into life you know to initiate the next cycle and in my imagination you know we found that they found many shrines that were all like um broken up inside some of the pylons and they put them back together again and they sit um in an open air museum it's called at karnak but so many have said that these were probably they believe it's 
it's theorized that they were all lined up in that center path. And I imagine seven of them, you know, it just makes sense. Mm-hmm. And they would have had, you know, the, the, the temple singers would have been there to tone as the sun came up and this beautiful harmony igniting each one of these aspects, these seven gates. Wow. I just, I just feel it. I, 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 my inner knowing says, you know, I, I can imagine this because when you go to Abydos and you go into that second um, hepastyle hall, you actually see the seven gates of the seven netters, Horus and Isis and Osiris, and and you have Ra Harakti and you have Amun and you have. Um, Pata, and you have one for Seti one, of course, seven aspects, seven, seven, seven basically holies of holies where they would have brought the barks. So that's why I can so, you know, and I imagine the seven, but then I'm, I'm seeing that this was a patterning. So, you know, again, I'm not saying it was a fact, but uh, it could very well have been. Um, and so, again, I, I just mentioned the, the, the serpent. Uh, being born into the container, which is life. Um, and I just, I, you know, I've never pointed this out, but when you see it, when it splits into the dual opposing wave spin, one is a lotus and one is a papyrus. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, the little things we don't notice, but it's there. It's showing us the duality, right brain, left brain. Right ascension, left ascension, dual opposing waveform and direction. Which way will you spin? You know, it's this is from India. um, And uh, you see the two keys again, and you see the two directions facing each other that open the the central gate. You see the sun and the moon, silver and gold. um, and, And we now know how to open that last gate. So, you know, the, the, the thing is, which way will you spin or how will you harness the spins? The Lord of Time, the Demiurge, in the form of the rampant lion. But of course, <laughs> it has to be. Often part lion, part serpent, the Demiurge controls the flow of energy. And Wajit, by the way, is part lion and part serpent at times. Um, the Demiurge controls the flow of energy in our human world, money and time. Um, time and space Um, and that image of the lion he's holding the two keys at you know at his center facing each other to create the gate Um, yeah the power the holder of the keys has the power to turn the doors of heaven and hell power over peace or war on earth it's it it's it doesn't get any simpler than that Um, and also in that chapel dedicated to isis on the um on the uh, West Bank, I, I noticed this and it just blew me away. They have names of the kings in these cartouches. And above them, you see the Neb symbol um, with the uh, disc with the two culprits coming out of it. But the, um, the, the, the names on the upper register showed the queen's name with a blue Neb. And the one on the lower register showed it with a, a red Neb. Hmm. So the one that's closer to heaven is blue and the one that's closer to earth. So again, I'm seeing right brain, left brain. (laughs) Again, you're always seeing they they understood in so many different ways. And it's so subtle. If I, I don't know how I noticed it, but I guess my mind is asking questions. And so somehow, you know, subconsciously, intuitively, I'm being directed to see these things. Well, you mentioned before that stars moving towards us are perceived as blue and moving away from us are seen as red. Is that right? Yes, that's true. (laughs) That's true. That's why oftentimes you'll see um, Mother Mary with a blue cloak or with a red cloak. Mm -hmm. Um, And the red cloak is when Sirius is moving away and the blue is when Sirius is moving closer. So, yeah, so many subtle things um, and becoming more aware, opening our senses will bring us closer. Even when we're out in nature, just opening our senses to the patterning of life. Um, And this is what they encouraged us to do. Um, This is something else I had never seen before. But since the uh, chamber was cleaned at uh, Dendera 
the Osiris chamber, over the doorway into the chamber, you could see there's the center, but on either side, you actually see Osiris in a container on one side um, and out of the container on the other. He's in between two images of Ha'api. Um, and on the other side, you have the new cycle of the sun with um, uh, Anubis <laughs> on either side, the path openers. So isn't that interesting? Just fascinating. You know, every time I go to the temple, I see new things. And I'm just always amazed to see all this imagery um, that speaks volumes. This is something else that was on the ceiling. And I just, it, again, it's the fairy man. Have you ever heard of the fairy man? Mm -hmm. Who guides us through the underworld? Right, the river sticks. Exactly. Well, there he is on the ceiling of Dendera, of that chamber. And you see there's Raharakti in his silent, you know, he's being ferried across. He's That's his silent mode. Um, and behind him, you see the Bennu bird, right? The phoenix. Or, or, the, well, the phoenix, exactly, who will bring in the next cycle um, to sit on the, um, like the little um, top of the pyramid, the, um, oh, help me out. Anyway, you know <laughs> what I mean. Um, so it, it, I, I did some research and the ferryman in ancient Egypt was called Aachen and he guides Ra through the underworld. Um, the chief deity in Egyptian mythology, Ra, when considered as a sun god, was thought to traverse the daytime sky in a boat, cross the underworld at night in another one named Meseket. As the mythology developed, so did the idea that the boat Meseket was controlled by a separate ferryman who became known as Aachen. In Egyptian mythology, the underworld was composed of the general area named Duat and a more pleasant area to which the morally righteous were permitted named Aru. But, you know, the ferryman is here in Egypt, but we also, well, here are some images again of Ra, so you know what I was talking about, and the Bennu bird, always on this boat. It was hard to see the last image, and that's why I added, I put my own little blue um, paddle in there for you, because you, you could barely see it. Um, and it's hard to see these images, especially on, you know, some of the small screens that you watch uh, YouTube videos, uh, podcasts on. But the imagery is there. And this gives you another idea of what Ra and the Bennu bird look like. Um, but that ferryman is also known as Charon in Greek mythology. And it's Saturn. And we also know him as the Grim Reaper, right? Mm -hmm. You can see the souls, right? Um, at that crossing point, will the ferryman take us to the other side? In Greek mythology, he is the boatman who ferries the souls of the dead across the waters of Haiti or Acheron to the judgment, which will determine their final resting place. He's Saturn, folks. This is a depiction of the ferryman in Tikal. I'm asking, oh, I saw it and I immediately, so you see the figure in the water, you see the volcano in the background, <laughs> right? Um, and it's uh, from the Mayan temple in Tikal, and it's said to be to illustrate a man in a boat escaping from a land seeking into the ocean. You can see a drowning man in a volcano erupting and collapsing into the water. Discovered and photographed by a German archaeologist, it was moved to Berlin, unfortunately destroyed during World War II. They are guessing at, you know, that he's just escaping, but he looks all dressed up like something important, right? Um, and to me, he, he could very easily be that same image of the ferryman. And there are the souls waiting and wondering if they will get across. Um, and, and, and take a look. Okay, on the far left, you have Saturn holds the sickle for the harvesting of souls. Um, and, you know, I, I say maybe he's just killing the beast, <laughs> <laughs> right? Which is the movement allowing, just like you said with Sobek, you know, ready to digest our souls you know, our, our physical, so our souls can escape the confinement. This is what Saturn is all about. Here's Saturn, and this is so fantastic. He's riding the chariot. Now, the chariot has been related to the Big Dipper, but here, what's what's driving this chariot are the two images of Draco. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's facing both directions, and he's holding the sickle. Isn't this fantastic? Saturn being responsible, again, he's the bottom. How do you turn lead into gold? He's Capricorn and Aquarius, those turning points. 
when everything flips and we breathe out again from moments of silence. Mm -hmm. So um, here we have set killing the beast. Um, so, so Ra can keep going, but is it this same knowing that, you know, set Satan, Saturn is killing the movement. It's the sine wave that, you know, Mehen, he's actually killing, he's repelling Apophis. He's repelling the snake that's in motion, but it's, it's the same as Mehen in the skies. It's the same as Mehen being the labyrinth in the game board. It's movement. Um, bringing us back to a moment of silence and enlightenment. Um, and one, you know, I want to show you this again. We we saw it before, but who is at the bottom of the Dendera zodiac? But Saturn, um, as Horus the bull with the sickle, right? Mm -hmm. There you have it. Um, and right next to Aquarius, this is the symbol for Aquarius. Um, right next to Horus as Saturn, that portal. Um, and then you see Leo behind him um, because that is the golden gate from uh, from Aquarius to Leo. Leo has its paws right on the symbol of Aquarius. And of course, then we see another image of Leo, which represents the annual cycle and the path that he takes. Mm. So um, it, it, it's just everywhere if you're really looking. Um, and these two images, I, I really point this out because they want us to see, you know, men have turned this ancient knowing into something we might judge as evil. That looks, you know, that looks like the devil, right? Uh, that looks like what they've told us Satan represents. But I hope by this point, you know, that there is no good and bad. There's just tools that can be used for good and evil. Um, and the patterns can't be good or evil. They just are. And once we know how to harness and navigate them, we can bring the two. We can transmute polarity and bring it back to that moment of enlightenment. Um, and the image on the far left is just beautiful. It shows the black box of Saturn at the bottom, right? And the dual opposing wave spin, the two swastika symbols going either direction at Saturn. And the caduceus emerging out of it. How can that be evil? Look at the wings. One's going up and one's going down. His hands, one's pointing up and one's pointing down. Dual opposing waves spin within us. That's the chaos, mm -hmm. right? That's the chaos that Horus and Set and St. George are killing. That's the beast. And it's within and you cannot kill the beast. You can only transmute it because if you kill the beast, you kill yourself. Um, and these are some of the things that have been twisted and turned. Um, the beast itself is the chaos, and we can transmute it. Um, I've shown this before. Um, you can see those two images. You see Bess in the center. Um, the two come together and come to our moment of silence. The heart. <laughs> On the far right, we see the occult anatomy of the human figure, and the heart has got the eye in it. The heart is where the consciousness lies. Mm -hmm. The heart breathes out the Taurus field, and everything happens. Yet that is where we bring everything back to center. And even this other image, um, it's, it's an image de depicting alchemy, and you see within it there's the two keys, and all of this is within two um, containers that form the shape of the heart and you see the sun and the moon and you see the upside down sun holding one key because we are upside down and backwards and you see the human skull in the bottom holding the silver key and um, you know one takes you up and the other one brings you you know it, it is here on earth um, and you have the Christ figure and you have Satan or Set on the other side. It's all the same thing. They're showing us the truth because the truth isn't being told. So we have to discern it through ancient symbolism and ancient knowing. Um, we have, it, it literally just opening our senses and waking up. <laughs> just waking up. This is awesome. This is, um, I, I just saw... Randall Carlson did a wonderful video at the winter solstice as well. And he brought uh, this image of Mithra up 
And uh, here we see Mithra killing the beast and it's the bull. Um, and he's actually has a knife to the right leg of the bull and that represents the Big Dipper, right? Mm -hmm. And you see the serpent of Draco. So again, it's that same imagery. Take a look at what he's wearing. Um, that's called the Pharyngian cap. It's usually depicted as red and it's the cap of Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and behind him, you have the four horses of the apocalypse, which is really just coming to that moment of silence, killing the movement of the circumpolar stars so we can have that moment of bliss. Um, yeah. There's the Pharyngian cap and I show you, it's normally depicted as red and quite obviously where we got the, the image of Santa Claus. It's Bess, I've always said, Bess is Santa Claus. He brings about, he is that moment of silence. Um, and here we also see Horus killing the beast on the ceiling of Dendera. Um, <laughs> and it, it is the Big Dipper. This is Tarette. She's got, she, she's related to, to Draco and she's got this loop wrapped around the leg of the bull and there Horace is sparing the bull, stopping the movement. That's the beast, it's chaos. So there's one great breath within our perception of life. Although time is an illusion in a linear context, we can take that breath or hero's journey in a moment within a lifetime or in sync with the cycles and cycles within our perception of time. We are all on the same journey. However, we're always being challenged to rise above the chaos we call life, to rise to higher levels of conscious awareness and experience. It's why we agree, some would say, we lined up for this, to enter the game and travel the labyrinth of perceived time and space. That's what it is, in a nutshell. <laughs> The end. <laughs> and here you have Bess killing the beast. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> How cool is that? 